Uh, we're going to look at Jesus' early ministry. Just touch on it today. Uh, it wasn't what I originally planned to come here with. I knew, I guess, six weeks ago that I would be up here pretty soon and started looking for something to do. But in, in the course of, of trying to put something else together, I had, in my normal watching, watched some uh, programs by uh, Pastor David, David Asherick. And uh, so I'm stealing some of this from him. For, for, forgive me, but I think you're allowed to steal if you announce who you took it from. It's not all from him, but pieces of it are. What do we do when, we have a minister, when we're going to go out into ministry? We're going to start maybe a, uh, a series of meetings or, or a pastor is going to go out and try to reach people. Well, one of the first concerns that you have is what? Who is your audience? Who are the people you're trying to reach? What are their culture? What are their beliefs? Who are they? Where do they fit? So what was the culture that Jesus came to minister to? Well, Judah and Jerusalem had been a vassal state and times a slave state for more than 600 years at the time Christ was born. The Babylonians took them away, attacked them in 605, turned them into a vassal state, and eventually had to come back, as we know from studying Jeremiah, and finally destroy Jerusalem after the third attack. They took virtually everybody away who was living there and brought them to Babylon, they lived in Babylon for about 70 years before they were allowed to return. That's not exactly right, but the Babylonian Empire was superseded by who? The Medes and the Persians. In Jewish tradition, the, the um, Persian kings are called the shepherd kings because they allowed them a certain amount of freedom, and they kind of shepherded the people of Israel, but it didn't last. After the Medes and Persians came the Greeks, and after the Greeks came the Romans. So I can't really picture this situation growing up in America, but 600 years of being subjugated, sometimes to a ruling country that would treat you halfway decently, sometimes to people who actually murdered the children and, and, and committed all kinds of horrible things. Their temple was torn down. I don't know what it does to a society to have 600 years of that kind of turmoil. But it, had, it, it slowly eroded their culture, and it eroded their firm belief in God. They were losing everything that they had over the course of this 600 years. Now, there was a time, 161 uh, B.C., the Maccabees for a while had revolted, and for a little while they were under their own rule. But for the most part, they were a slave nation. They were, they were serving someone else. In this constant turmoil of having people put in as governors, people removed as governors, different countries coming in and conquering, uh, then those countries getting pushed out by others. In that constant turmoil, a vacuum was created. And that vacuum was a leadership, a political leadership vacuum. And the group began to fill that vacuum. And that group was the priests. We saw that also happen later when Rome was about to fall. So the priests began to be not just priests, but they began to take over the secular power too. They began to take over the administrative power. And they formed a political party. Today we call that political party, and at the time of Christ, that political party was called the Sadducees. The Sadducees were primarily made up of the priests. Um, I'm reading from Acts chapter 5, uh, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. So the Sadducees seem to have arrived first on the scene as a group with a lot of wrong ideas, but they became almost a political party, and they became a doctrine that was in Israel at the time that Jesus was there. In response to the Sadducees, there were other very wealthy people who developed different ideas and didn't like the Sadducees holding both priestly control and secular control. And they became a group that we call today the Pharisees. And they were called in the time of Christ the Pharisees. And the Pharisees held different beliefs, different religious beliefs from the Sadducees. The Pharisees were also using the power of Rome to try to get themselves power, to ride along with Rome, to, to push out the Sadducees. So we had, at the time of Christ, 
these two fighting groups, and this was a life and death fight. They were fighting for control of Judah. Both of them with very different ideas as to what proper, as to what proper doctrine was. The Sadducees tended to be somewhat Hellenistic. They tended to be following the Greek line, which was offensive to many of the Jews. The one thing that we, we seem to know a lot, I know many of you will remember this, in Luke chapter 20, I'm reading from Luke 20, verse 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. So we know that the Sadducees, at least as a group, had completely abandoned the idea of the resurrection. What I learned in reading some other things, extra biblical things, is that we often think, I often thought that the Pharisees at least had some of it right because the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. But from what I'm reading, the Pharisees believed in a slightly different resurrection than we do today. There's, there's things in uh, Josephus to indicate, Josephus was a historian from the first century. Uh, there's things in Josephus to indicate that when they talked about resurrection, they weren't thinking about being resurrected and going to heaven. They were thinking about coming back in another body, maybe coming back as a baby again, some kind of immortal spirit type of thing that would carry on as the bodies were wore out, if you were righteous. The word Pharisee actually means separated, and that's what they attempted to do. They attempted to separate themselves from the others who were around them. <clears throat> because they saw themselves as being holier. The Pharisees became purely legalistic. And we know from Jesus' uh, discourses with them, we know how bad the situation got. I'm going to read one little thing just to bring it up. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He, Jesus, answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your hmm, traditions, I believe is the word. I cut it off when I, when I did my notes. Okay, so we have Sadducees, who is the priestly party. We have Pharisees, who were also among the mega-rich and who were among the rulers of, of Judah, but who had very different wrong doctrines than the wrong doctrines of the Sadducees. We know there was another group around, the Essenes. The Essenes are really kind of interesting. They are not mentioned directly in the Bible, but it's known that they lived in isolated communities. They were kind of hermit monks living in small groups on their own, separating themselves from the rest of, of uh, Jewish community. Many of them were celibate, Many of them lived in intentional poverty. John the Baptist is often believed to have lived with the Essenes for a period of time because they lived in the desert, which was called the wilderness, and we know that John the Baptist was raised in the wilderness. We also know that John the Baptist got his name from baptizing. And we know that, that the, uh, they find in uh, archaeological digs in the Essene communities, they find baptismal pools where they were doing ritual washing. So we think that John the Baptist grew up with the Essenes. For a long time it was thought that maybe the Dead Sea Scrolls were actually written by the Essenes. They thought that because the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in cliffs above where they find an old archaeological site of the Essene community. Well, fairly recently it was, it was I think, settled because they found um, ink pots and ink wells that were dried out over the 2,000 years, but they tested that ink to some of the ink in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's the same. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are perhaps the library of the Essene community. Third group, working during the time of Christ with very different ideas. The Essenes, I don't know all of their beliefs, I don't know how well their beliefs are known, but I do know that they are reported to have believed in predestination, so that you would have been saved or not saved, based upon what God had decided for you before you were ever born. Okay, the fourth group that we know of during the time is the Zealots. The Zealots seem to be somewhat associated with the ideas of the Pharisees 
except that they were seeking political solutions. They, the, the zealots wanted to actually accomplish the overthrow of Rome. They felt that they had enough strength or that they could build enough strength that they were God's chosen people and they were they to try, they would be able to throw off the uh, Roman yoke. We know a little bit about the zealots from, from Josephus and some extra biblical uh, information that's around. But we also know that uh, we're told in Luke chapter 6, verse uh, 15, that one of uh, Jesus' disciples was called Simon Zelotus, Simon the Zealot. They eventually, in the, after the time of Christ, I'm just going, uh, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but it's interesting, maybe to show you the character of the people who the Zealots were. After the time of Christ, they eventually did succeed, you know, in causing a rebellion in Judah and Jerusalem. 66 AD, there was a rebellion. They, for a period of time, threw off the Roman yoke. And by 70 AD, the Romans came back, and that was the end of Jerusalem. They completely destroyed Jerusalem. That was the end of the temple. They tore down every stone in the temple. That's who the zealots were who were there at that time. So you have four main groups. You have Sadducees, you have Pharisees, you have the Essenes, and you have the Zealots. All of them with different doctrines, all of them with different beliefs, some of them looking to try, try to use the Romans to acquire their own power, some of them trying to overthrow the Romans, some of them just trying to hold their own power, which they already had in the face of the Romans. So was that the people to whom Jesus ministered. That was a little piece of it, but there's much more. If you look out at the field of people to whom Jesus was ministering, we know that there were many very wealthy people. Joseph of Arimathea, the entire Sanhedrin, many of the Sadducees and the Pharisees were mega wealthy of their day. We also know that then, as now, not everybody followed what they said they followed. Okay? Uh, it's mentioned in Matthew 11. One of the things Jesus was accused of was being a friend of publicans and sinners. Well, the publicans and sinners were people basically who were Jews. Well, sinners are sinners. I know you know what that is. But the publicans are basically people who were Jews, but who neglected the entire thing and went and said, I'm going to have a party, I'm going to work. Many of them work for the Romans. The publicans, I think, comes from the idea of a public employee. Work for the Romans, I'm going to have a party, and I'm not really so interested in this Jewish law stuff. I'm Jewish, but, you know, I'm going to have a good time today and not care about it too much. You also then, as, as now, you had poor people. It's okay to be poor, but it wasn't okay to be poor during the time the year one. And the reason I'm saying it wasn't okay, not that it wasn't okay, but if you were poor, you were pretty much locked out of heaven. Think about it, if you're a poor farmer and you're struggling to su support your family, how can you keep up with the ritual washings when you're out in the field in the middle of the day? How, how can you can do, do all of these ceremonies that the Pharisees said and told the people, you have to do if you want to be in this kingdom. What if you're the wife of a poor fisherman? How do you do it? How do you maintain all of these special um, ceremonies that you had to go through to maintain purity as your church leaders were telling you you had to main pur maintain purity? It was hopeless for you. If you were poor, you were effectively locked out of the kingdom of heaven. As as far as what your church leaders were telling you. What happens if you get sick? You remember in, in chapter John, in, in chapter John, in John chapter 9, Jesus' disciples, now they had been with him for a time, and Jesus' disciples said to him, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. See, if you were sick or you were disabled, the church, the religious leaders at the time were telling you 
you're sick and you're poor and you're disabled because you're a sinner. And it's your sin or the sin of someone around you that did this to you. Now, can you imagine this group? You have mega wealthy people. You have probably some people who are poorer than anyone we would ever see today. You have sick people who are left without help. You have the families, the wives who are struggling, trying to help their husbands, but they can't. They can't bring their family into the religion as they want to because they're told they're not fit. Okay. So that was Jesus' mission field. 600 years of wrong ideas. And Jesus steps into this. Now, how did Jesus step into it? We just came through Christmas. How did Jesus step into it? He was born a child. He was born as a human child. He didn't come down from heaven as the great king, wearing clothes with 10,000 times, 10,000 angels behind him. He came as a child. And we're going to get to a very important point very soon, but we need to understand the time. So who was Jesus? You know, when he was born, what happened to him? Uh, Luke chapter 2. I know we've all heard this probably three times in the last three weeks, so we'll hear it a fourth time around the Christmas story. And she brought forth her, son, her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. She put him and she gave birth to him. She put him in diapers, which means he needed diapers, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. Now, who do you think Christ was? When Jesus was six months old, what happened? Did Mary sit there holding him and studying his face and he began to give her a discourse about the law and the prophets? He's a baby. We're told he was fully God and fully man. He was a baby. He was learning and growing the same way every one of us does and the same way every one of our children does. The dividing line for a young Jewish man was the attainment of his 12th birthday. At 12 years old, you were considered ceremonially, ceremonially a man. At 12 years old, you would go to the Passover and be able to partake in the ceremony there. Now, Ellen White tells us in the Desire of Ages, page 78, she tells us at the time that Jesus was there in the temple, on the, having attained 12 years, she tells us the mystery of his mission was opening to the Savior. So he was about 12 years old when he began to understand really who he was and what his job was going to be. He didn't understand the whole thing, but he was growing into this knowledge. We know that Jesus actually started his, uh, we're told, in case anyone, I, I want to share this with you anyway, in case anyone isn't really fully on board with the growth of Christ as a man and the learning of Christ, we're told in Luke uh, 2.52 uh, that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor, in favor with God and man. He increased in wisdom. He was not born an all-knowing God. He was learning. He was reading, and he was learning. And he was realizing, he had realized at the time he was 12, who he was, what his job was going to be. Okay, we're told in Luke 3 that Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, who was the son of Heli. So they're talking here, about when he began his ministry. He attains 30 years of age, which was about the age when a priest would start functioning as a priest. If you were a normal person and you were going to be a soldier, you came in when you were 20 years old, but the priest started at 30. Jesus reaches about his 30th year, and he's going to begin his ministry. So he's had basically from the time he was 12 to the time he was 30, to consider this vast, diverse group of people and how he was going to reach them. He had 18 years to think about it. 
Okay, let's say that you were there at the time. And Jesus said, listen, would you help me write a sermon? What would you do? How would you begin it? It's the majesty of heaven. He's coming to deal with these people who have not heard the truth in 600 years. Poor, injured, hurt people. And the wealthy, comfortable people who did much of the hurting to them. All of them his children. Everyone someone he was concerned about. What would you do? How would you write that first sermon for him? How would you write, and this would not have been his first sermon, we were going to go into the Sermon on the Mount, but it was a very early sermon, and by far the longest sermon that's in the Bible of his. <clears throat> it was his introduction in many ways to Israel. How would you start it? I don't know what I'd do. Would I try to grab him by the throat? Would I try to say, hey, Jesus, let's start with some big-time miracles and really wow him? You might, or you might scare them to death. Should we go after those Pharisees first? Should we tell them how much damage they've done? Do we want to destroy them? Do we want to give them a chance too? What do we do with all of these injured people? How do you deal with it? Okay, let's take a look at how Jesus deal, dealt with it. Okay, we're back in Matthew 5. I'm going to add a little bit down to, uh, to the uh, verse that Lou stopped at. Matthew, I'm reading Matthew 5, verse 2. We're going to go into the beginning of the Sermon, of the sermon on the Mount. The very beginning of this, the sermon, the first eight sentences are carved out and they're given a special name. They're called the Beatitudes. Beatitude means happy. Now I have to take a deep breath before I do this. <laughs> okay, he says, he sits down and he says to them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Does that make sense? I have to tell you, all the times I read this, until it was pointed out to me through those videos I saw, all the time I read this, I never understood it. I mean, I've read the Beatitudes, I've read the Sermon on the Mount, and I read it like it was Proverbs, a whole bunch of really good, cool things that we need to know, but not knowing really the continuity of it. But think about this for a minute. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's say that you were that farmer, or you were the wife of the poor fisherman, or you were the person who was sick. Think how he opened up. How his opening, his opening words were. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He started. Ellen White says in... Um, thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, she says that the words fell like bombs on the ears of the people who were hearing it. Can you imagine that? Your whole life you were told no? No. And Jesus says yes. We do. We have an awesome God. But it's more than just that. Can you imagine, you know, in, in Isaiah we're told, in Isaiah 65 we're told about people who say, Stand by thyself, for I am holier than thou. And that's a quote from Isaiah 65. Can you imagine being a Pharisee or a Sadducee, standing maybe within the distance that you can still hear him, but not so close that one of these poor sick people would dare think to touch you? Because can you imagine if you were touched by someone who was poor? You'd spend the rest of the day washing, and you were wearing good clothes, because all you had was good clothes. Can you imagine sitting there and hearing, hearing those words? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Well, what kind of a preacher is this Jesus? 
I am a Pharisee, and I am not poor in spirit. In his, his very first sentence, he's trying to get them to think. Yes, maybe you're not poor in spirit. Maybe you should be. But who is Jesus to say that? How can he say that? He does something here. He doesn't say the prophets have said, the sages have said, the rabbis have said. He says on his own, blessed are the poor, poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He's speaking with authority. In his very first sentence, he declares himself to be one who can speak with authority. He wraps his hands around all his hurting children. And the children who were doing the hurting, he tries to get them to look at what they were doing. In his very first sentence. I want to share the Beatitudes with you a little bit. There are only eight sentences, so it's not going to be too long. Okay. First one is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, mourning means sadness. It, doesn't, it can mean sadness for the loss of someone, but it means sadness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You know what these eight sentences are? The first sentence he announced who he was. He put his arms around his hurting children. And he gently began to try to cause the ones who were doing the pain to think. If you follow these eight beatitudes down. They're the course of what you go through in your life as you're being converted. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is, is the kingdom of God. You have to feel that need to start off with. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see your need, you're poor in spirit, and you begin to have great sorrow of who you are, of what you've done, of where you've been going. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I don't think there's a person in this, this church today who can be less than meek when they're heartbroken. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You begin to want that change. You're meek, you're broken. You begin to know that you need that change, and you begin to search for that change. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What makes you merciful? You see who you are. You see what you've done. And you can't bring yourself to be anything but merciful to someone else. Because when you really see yourself, you never meet anyone who isn't better than you. That doesn't deserve mercy more than you. If you really see what's gone on in your life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Our hearts become cleansed through the action of Christ. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You reach a point, not just where you're trying to put down wars, but where you don't want to hear the rumors anymore, where you'd rather put it 
let it stop with me. I don't want it to go any further. Where you keep peace by not saying things you could have said. The last one. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I'll tell you about a little bit about being purchased persecuted for righteousness' sake. Doesn't always come the way you think it's going to come. Doesn't always come you're reading an Adventist track and someone shoots you because he hates Adventist and your position in the kingdom boy is guaranteed. Doesn't always come that way. The persecution. You know, I think that 2015 was a rough year for our church, for our members. Maybe I see it more now than I did before because we're doing the prayer lists and we're praying. I, I'm, I'm attending the prayers in the back and people will sometimes say and share things with the group to be prayed for that they won't um, always want distributed to the whole church. So you get to hear a lot of things. You know, I'll tell you, 15 was a rough year for, our, for many of the members in our church. A number of our people lost people they love. A number of our people were healed, but a number of people have become sick, too. And a number of our members are struggling with pain. Many people in our church are dealing with very, very difficult family and friend relationships. Many people in our church are struggling with financial things, problems, that we most of the time don't see. Occasionally we do see, but there's a struggle going on. Persecution may not always come the way you expect it to. It can come from the government. You're a Seventh-day Adventist and we're going to track them all down, but it can come in much simpler forms and times you don't even realize what it is. But for our church today, as it was 2,000 years ago, ours is the kingdom of heaven. Thank you.